Next up, we have Louis Montez uh, here to speak with us about something that was the era of, uh, I think, 2022, decentralized computing in the browser. And I will let him take it from here. Thank you. All right. Okay, Louis Montez, I'm on most of the social uh, media things as Montez Lou, um, Blue Sky, which also I don't have an icon for. Um, I've been coding for a very long time. Um, way back in Web 1.0, it was super cool and we could put pictures on web pages in 95. It was a major advancement there. Um, something really cool happened though in 2006. I know there's a lot of developers in here that were around for this transition. What happened was, uh, the rest of the industry agreed that Microsoft's ActiveX XML HTTP request object was pretty cool, so made it standard, and we got Web 2.0, right? So um, Web 2.0 was cool that we could build applications inside of browsers, um, but since then, I've been you know, very interested in you know, maybe the next 10 years worth of um, APIs to come out. There were still kind of Web 2.0, right? Web sockets, awesome, RTC, Video, progressive web apps, right? Doing stuff offline. Um, web Bluetooth, I really dig. Serial, USB, you can build a bunch of robotic stuff on top of this. Um, more recently, Web GPU, um, Web Assembly, and uh, very importantly, very recently, threading in Web Assembly. So all of these things, are super cool. I've, I'm still really excited about doing browser development or applications in browsers because of these APIs. Um, so you can imagine how excited I am about um, Web3, decentralization, right? And, um, you know, just uh, what that means. We're not dependent on any particular vendor or particular service um, to, to communicate between um, browsers. So what I'm going to do on this talk here is talk about um, some of the really cool APIs we have in browsers for Web3, okay? Um, we didn't get any, actually. There is no um, new browser APIs that allow us to do decentralization, all right? So what do we do? Well, um, we know that if we want to have browsers or any applications talk to each other without going through a, a service, everything has to act sort of as a client and a server, right? It listens for requests, maybe forwards things on. So to decentralize, everything has to be both. All right, so um, then just build a native app, right? Okay, because browsers can't do this. Build a native app. Now, um, I actually really dig Electron, um, but you might not need it. In fact, I might help uh, maintain this site because most of the reasons that we were using um, Electron for, um, there's browser APIs for, except for one really, really important one, and that's direct TCP and UDP access, right? To talk directly to the network, to listen for something on the network, to talk directly to another peer. We don't have that. So absolutely use Electron if you want to, if you want to build something like that. Um, but if you've known me for a while, um, I've started coming to Cascadia since the first Cascadia, and uh, me and my friend Blaine Bublitz released something um, during the first Cascadia, right? So wait, you already put Node in a browser, so it's a server, right? Um, and we, we did, sort of. We put, uh, you can include a script, node.js, and have the um, Node HTTP APIs so you can create a service. Um, there was definitely some shenanigans here. What we did was uh, use Chrome.net, which uh, we made an extension to talk to the Chrome.net package. We made something called Node Chromify, which allowed us to um, open up a TCP port. And um, very, very hacky, but sure, we had something like Node in a browser. All right, so um, even with that, though, maybe that's still useful to have Node running um, or an HTTP listener running in a browser, so it can be sort of acting as a server, but okay, um, how do you get to that peer then? How do you get to that web server? Um, so do you open up your firewall, you go to your router, you say forward port 3000 or 8000 or whatever to this LAN IP address so that somebody on the other side of the world can see your public address and come through here and nobody does that, right? What do we do? We use reverse proxies. So if you've done any mobile development in particular, um, and you want your phone to get to the web page that's running on your local machine, you would use a reverse proxy. And there's several of them out there. Um, Ngrok is really popular, local tunnel. Um, Async is one that I've been working on. But, but um, we get something else from doing it this way. Uh, HTTPS, or um, security on top of this, right? So we can have an HTTPS site, because all the cool web 2.0 APIs, or the newer APIs anyways, um, 
that I want to run, like web Bluetooth, things I want to talk to require that you're um, on a secure web page. So just having um, the hacked uh, local listener is cool for local host. You can still talk to those APIs, but not when you want to share it with somebody else. So how does this work? How does reverse proxy work? Well, on your laptop, you would run a proxy, ngrok, local tunnel, hsync, one of these things here. And when you want to, from the outside, maybe you're on a you know, 5G connection on your phone, um, you want to make a request for that website. So it comes into um, a reverse proxy server out in the cloud somewhere. It talks to your proxy, sends the message. Your proxy talks to your local web server. It replies back, and boom, you've got a secure web page that's running, right? And you do updates and everything. You can do all that development in real time, and somebody is using that. So that's, um, that's a pretty cool thing to do, um, having something like NGROC or one of these running on your laptop to uh, facilitate reverse proxying to your server. Cool. Um, but uh, what if we were to put the reverse proxy in the web page? Now, um, if it's open source and, say, written in JavaScript, uh, like local tunnel or HSync, we could potentially put this um, into a web page itself. All right, so I'll do a, a quick demo of this here. All right, so um, let's say I am going to change can we see that okay? All right. Um, I'm going to say hello from, don't scan this please yet. <laughs> um, and okay, cool. So we are changing content, we're doing a web response, right? So we, we basically have a reverse proxy that's listening inside of a web page to handle HTTP traffic, parse the HTTP packets, you know, give you some HTML, send that back out. And so, sure, we're running a web server inside of a web browser to deliver content, and we're not having to use a Chrome extension, but we are using a reverse proxy, right? So um, that, that's getting us a little bit closer, I'd say, to, um, to running Node in, uh, um, in a web page. But it's still not Node. That was some Node libraries that I sort of uh, Webpacked or browserified or whatever in order to, um, to handle the request. Uh, Node itself, it's HTTP parser. HTTP parser is uh, native. I think it's written in C. Um, and so that one doesn't just browserify directly. So there's some shimming and whatnot to handle HTTP requests and um, spit them back out. Okay. But um, there has been um, an API released. Uh, I think it was in February of this year. Um, that actually is Node inside of a browser. So um, a company called StackBlitz um, has been doing some really great work. And uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that threading as part of, the, uh, as part of WebAssembly has been really pushed forward by the um, StackBlitz people uh, for this reason. They want to be able to run threaded applications inside of a browser um, using, you know, using native threading which is, is pretty important when you're serving up lots and lots of web requests to, um, to not block, right? We, we want to defer to another thread to handle a request. Okay, so let's try this one out. Um, and the demo gods love me. This is perfect. Okay, so what do we have here? We have, um, we're importing Express. Uh, we've got, uh, so the tech that, that they're using is called web containers. Um, so we can install, uh, say, Express or HappyJS or whatever um, uh, routing uh, web server thing that you like. Um, but they go a lot further than that. So one thing that they do is also have Nodemon on a virtual file system as well as NPM um, client installed all within this little node environment that's running inside of an iframe, inside of a browser, okay? Um, and they do something even on top of that, which is really nice, that they will uh, give you a URL that passes through a, um, a service worker, so you could potentially do this stuff online, have multiple browser tabs open, um, and do stuff like this. So let's say we want to change this on the fly. Seattle. Uh, Yes. All right, and we have uh, Nodemon restarting the thing, and if we were to open this up, that didn't actually update. Okay, well, the, the demo gods were 
were nice at first. Let's try this one more time. Okay, cool. So, is that right? Welcome to AWeb Containers. Are you guys able to see that okay? Yeah. Good? All right, cool. Okay, so the, the thing is, um, that's, this is a, a major leap forward here, right? Because now we can build um, all, all kinds of services that we do to run inside of a browser as an iframe. We are that much closer to decentralizing things, right? Because it isn't just um, web servers. We can kind of run anything in here. All right, so um, go just a little further um, on this. We're proxying HTTP, right? We're proxying web requests. Extremely useful. Is there any web developers in here? Probably a few. This is what we do, right? We need to send HTML along the way. Um, but we might want to tunnel other types of traffic. So if we have, um, let's say, a proxy on one side of the planet, another proxy on the other side of the planet, does it have to be just HTTP traffic? Could we send anything arbitrarily through this? Um, for example, let's say uh, one client, um, I like Postgres a lot. Um, Postgres, I use PG Admin, some people use Postgo, basically a native client um, that talks to Postgres. Well, maybe my Postgres is on another server or on another laptop. I can establish a connection. Um, I can listen locally using my, my little proxy. I can open up a port and say, hey, listen on port. 5432, TCP port 5432, which is what Postgres goes by default, pass through a proxy, get to the other side, and no networking involved, right? No um, opening up ports, no forwarding things, no doing pinholes in, in your Wi-Fi router to get to things, because we have both things reaching out, reverse proxying, all traffic can go through those. Yep, and we get a response. Okay. Um, and that, that's cool if we want to use something like Postgo or, or PG Admin or some other client to talk to another um, server. But couldn't those clients then, since I already said we could put a proxy inside of a browser, couldn't we have that client itself talk to that Postgres that's being proxied somewhere else? And absolutely, you can talk directly to it because we have a connection between the two and we can pack bytes, however, and make it over to the other side. All right. Um, but I, I showed that we were running Node inside of a web browser using StackBlitz's web containers. Um, and that was cool for HTTP, HTTP servers. Um, but what about other services like uh, Postgres itself? Well, as of, I think this is also February, another um, release was done uh, by another team, Supabase, that uh, put Postgres inside of Linux, inside of a browser. And absolutely, we now have Postgres. So, Cool, now I've got my post to go over here, connected to a local port, proxied through, a reverse proxy, going into maybe somebody, you, you told your friend, here's the link, open up this page because I need you to be Postgres for me. And your browser is now full on Postgres database and I'm using Postico to connect to that. Um, but why use Postico? I could use another web page to proxy to somebody's uh, Postgres running somewhere else. Okay. Um, I've, like I said, I've been developing for, for quite some time. Um, I've had to do a lot of stuff like this in the past where um, just to get a, a familiarity with the language that I'm working in, I want to do some low-level networking. So when we do a web server, typically, if it's, say, uh, create React app, and it fires up on port 3000, Internally, something like this, way down in, in, uh, under the covers in Node, this is happening, right? We are saying create a server. When we get some data, do something. Uh, when we get a connection, do something. Maybe we have some error handling. Um, handle something when it closes, when the, when the connection closes. And then listen on a particular port. So in this case, I am you know, creating a server, and this is just like an echo server, right? It gets some bytes, and it replies a message back. Every time it gets some bytes in, it replies. Now, could this thing right here, this isn't a web server, this is just a TCP listening server. It's not doing much. Could this be inside of StackBlitz's web container? Well, it says it's in here, right? This is a shell to the iframe of that environment with some files. And what is in that echo server? 
Uh, pretty much the same thing I said, I'm just handling things closing. Could I fire that up? Node echo server. And yes. So I'm listening, but listening to what? What's able to talk to this thing? Right? Like, this isn't listening on port 9000 on my local machine. It's inside of a Linux that's inside of an iframe that's inside of this web page. Um, so I've got to sort of expose that. I've got to say, all right, well, if I get requests, somehow relay that to this iframe, to this Linux, to node listening on port 9000. Cool. So I just told it, I, I just put something in here on the connection, told it to, to listen. Now, let's say um, over here, this, this could be the same machine, this could be a machine on the other side of the planet as well, but I'm going to say, hey, let's listen um, on port 9000, anything we get, let's forward it to that other connection, that other proxy. And that other proxy just happens to be in a web page. Okay, cool. Um, so npx, run some commands, listen. And if you've ever done low-level networking, what's the first thing you do? You made a server, you need to talk to it with something. Uh, you can't talk to that with a web browser. You can't talk to port 9000 there with a the web browser because it doesn't, you're not speaking HTTP. You're just sending stuff. So you can use Telnet. Telnet basically just opens up a pipe, opens up a TCP port, dumps bytes in when you hit enter, and whatever comes back out, it just displays on the screen. So we'll try that. Okay, and again, hello Seattle JS, and then we wait, and we wait, and we try again probably. Okay, one more try. Okay. And <laughs> I have some friends that saw this work five times right before I walked up here. Let's try this one more. Oh, sorry. My problem is I've opened this up too many times. <laughs> Let's, uh, that was dumb, say express node. Yeah, um, it didn't know which one to go to. Okay, and we have, yeah, we have a server up here and listening. We have node echo server. We're going to tell it to relay. There we go, okay. So what we got here is a Telnet client talking into a browser that's listening just using normal, not exactly normal, a lot of shims going on, a lot of weird stuff happening under the covers, but your typical net stack of Node, right? Um, and this doesn't have to be, this is Node right now because StackBlitz has a Node environment that they've created. Um, the Postgres, Superbase has Postgres running in something. So this is just sort of the start, right? We know we have WebAssembly and threads so we can now have um, these environments that can start doing network applications if we reverse proxy them. So um, it, it, it might not be super apparent, but I'd love to talk to whoever is interested um, in how to do this, because the web containers, um, StackBlitz has done some amazing work, but it has been mostly for um, just doing normal HTTP traffic, and they proxy that. Um, so there's some hacking involved in order to just make it arbitrary TCP stuff, like my echo server or Postgres or anything else. But we could start stitching these things together and really doing some amazing things inside of browsers. Okay, cool. So what you might have noticed though is um, that, that, that that's fine, right? That we will pass uh, messages through a proxy server to send you know, traffic. Well, what if you want it to be like a lot of video or something, or, or just a huge amount of data that we want to be tra um, sending between these two things? Well, um, it's only a, if you, anybody here has done WebRTC, we're talking about maybe 2K worth of messaging, right? Just a, a very small amount of bytes to exchange between two points in order for us to link them together with the direct um, 
uh, a direct RTC connection, right? Then you've got pretty much the full bandwidth between two points, so we can send as much data as we want. We also, at that point, aren't worried about, say, somebody with a bad proxy server here in the middle um, deciding that they want to sniff the traffic. Because although we're tunneling um, everything through this HTTPS connection, the server itself is able to parse. The server itself is able to say, hey, I know what this is. I'm routing it to this guy. I'm sending it to this guy. So um, we want to, after we've exchanged, hey, this is how we're going to talk to each other directly. Well, now, now these two endpoints can. So if you want to talk to uh, like Postgres on somebody's phone from your browser, that'll be direct once the connection, once we, we've started talking to each other, we can upgrade to a web RTC connection behind the scenes because it doesn't take that much to, to actually do it. Okay, so um, the proxy server itself, if it's also written in Node, can the uh, proxy server live um, um, next to one of these proxy clients, right? So instead of you just serving up your Create React app, can you serve up yet another proxy server? Well, we have one problem. Um, the way most of these things work, like NGROC and any of these others, is they'll give you a dynamic subdomain on top of, uh, so they'll have a wildcard cert and just dynamically make a name. Everything goes to that endpoint. Here's your dynamic name. If you want a sub subdomain, you can do that, but the, uh, the wildcard cert is gonna say, nope, that, that's not a good cert. Um, and this had me blocked for a while. But why would you even have to use a dot? Like, use whatever. Make your own um, routing. You've got 255 characters there um, on a subdomain that a wildcard cert will support. Um, you've got 65 on the domain name without the TLD. Um, you've got plenty of bytes to play around with here to encode however you want to spread out um, your nesting of proxying. Right, so that would, that would look something like this. That would be, um, instead of our web server, we would have another proxy server. It would spread out. Now we can, say, have multiple web servers or whatever servers behind a proxy server that's behind a proxy server. That, that could be a neat thing to do. But we could also put that proxy server in a web page because web pages with stack blitzes, web containers can now run node, so let's put that in there. But if we're gonna do that, why are we messing with anything but the web browsers here? And how many times um, could we nest this? Right, so we can have all of these things talking through some goofy routing, just playing with uh, domain names and subdomains. And in fact, um, why even have just one proxy server, right? When you can have uh, basically multiple proxy servers with nested browsers all routing, um, all running little bits of Linux underneath them, running Node or Postgres or whatever, okay? So, and if we could do this, maybe, um, <laughs> yes, yeah, as far as I went on this, sorry. <laughs> all right, so, is that decentralized or, or, or is that federated, right? Sounds like, wow, you just reinvented federated. Um, uh, let me get back to that. So I spent a lot of time um, over the last 10 years working for Internet of Things companies. And one thing we did for sure was centralize, right? Uh, most large companies that connect a bunch of devices, um, you know, a Google Home or uh, whatever, one of these little devices, right? These are all Internet of Things devices. They are doing something similar to reverse proxying. They are connected to a central location. We want to have a message that goes to those to say, turn on your lights in your garage. Um, and, but we're all going through a central location. And typically what we'll do is we'll register these devices. We'll give the device some ID, some token to authenticate with, or an app to authenticate the device. Um, and so cool. But it's neat to have these things stitched together and then use an app to talk to them. Um, but that's very much centralized, right? So we have all these little things that can do computing on them, um, and they're, talk, they're, they're, they're turned on, they're connected to the internet at all times, but they are centralized. Well, if we just say, okay, um, using a bunch of reverse proxies, we sort of re you know, inadvertently created another Internet of Things service, except that it's based on just host names, 
right? And DNS is one of the few things that actually is decentralized, right? We replicate these records of public IP addresses to go along with names. Uh, we have one that's an authority on this particular domain and, or uh, a list of them. So we can do things like wildcard certs, but we can definitely um, decentralize DNS. It's, it's in the name, or distributed in the name anyways. Uh, so we're better off if we do have a collection of devices that can speak to a different collection of devices arbitrarily and can nest these things, well, yeah, that's um, federated, um, but it's closer to the decentralized um, side of it. So um, no, that isn't exactly decentralized. Um, yes, it's more federated, uh, but it still might be useful. Okay, so cool, uh, we still don't have Web3. We still don't have decentralized, exactly. Uh, what are we missing? We still need this. I, I don't know why we don't have this yet, but we still need TCP and UDP to happen in the browsers. Um, as soon as this does, this opens up a thing. Now, there are um, other experimental browsers. There are flags behind, like Brave has got um, IPFS support, which can do local um, U UDP, similar to TCP, except that we just sort of fire out onto the land and say, hey, is anybody listening on anything interesting? So we can talk to each other and discover other pieces. We can have um, peer networks based on um, just talking on the LAN. Maybe this one knows, oh, I know how to get out to the internet. Um, so if we had UDP and TCP, we could actually do this. So we're not, we're still not there yet. I don't know if we're at web 2.5 or something actually, but um, that's, that's about all I got. That's all I have time for. Woo! All right, thank you.